Welcome to the Professional Muslim Women Podcast, a place for working Muslim women to share their stories, struggles, triumphs, and lessons learned along the way in pursuit of their careers. I'm Dr. Kali Hussein, And I'm Dr. Hani Ahmed. And in this podcast, we bring inspirational, trailblazing, successful, and fulfilled professional Muslim women to you. Get ready to be inspired and learn how you can forge your own path as well. Welcome to the Professional Muslim Women's Podcast. Hi. I am Dr. Kali Hussein, and I am a trauma surgeon, a surgical intensivist, and a mother of six. And I'm Dr. Hani Ahmed. I'm an internist and a mother of two, and we are both from Somalia. So we started this podcast because of our mutual shared experience of pursuing our careers and our family life. Yes. We think this podcast will serve an important place. It's inspired by our real life experiences of pursuing careers and family life as professional Muslim women. All right. So Henny and I met on social media through Facebook, through a Somali professional network in the process of creating a career fair for our youth. And in trying to create something, we realized that We both had the same experiences of not having a role model to look up to, especially being Muslim women and especially being mothers. So we felt like since we've both been through that and there still seems to be a lack of role models that we would create this platform so that Muslim women who are professionals who are going through these experiences within their career or young aspiring women who hope to pursue these careers can have something to rely on as far as shared experiences of being a Muslim woman is concerned. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We thought that, you know, there isn't a lot of platforms out there to discuss our journeys, our obstacles, triumphs. We wanted to be able to, you know, create a shared platform where we can tackle several things that are directly relevant to us as professional Muslim women. And one of the important things that we actually want to discuss on this podcast is the stereotypes, right? Mm -hmm. So if there's one thing that defines Muslim women is stereotypes, right? Stereotypes of being, you know, when you're a hijabi, that you're oppressed, right? That it's the only thing, exactly. Or that, you know, the only thing that you can aspire to become is a homemaker. Gendered roles and basically being in a submissive role. And this narrative is usually told by someone other than Muslim women, (laughs) right? (laughs) Exactly. Right. So some other things that we want to tackle as well is workplace difficulties that can arise due to stereotypes or prejudice or whatnot, especially around, you know, being a visible minority by wearing a hijab. So that one's a big one in our community. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like you stick out like a sore thumb. (laughs) (laughs) It's one of those things, you know, a lot of minorities feel. And I feel like being a woman, being African, being, you know, a hijabi, which is, you know, a woman who wears a hijab is basically being in a category of being the minority of a minority of a minority. Oh, yeah. Like a triple minority. (laughs) For sure. (laughs) Exactly. And the other thing is that we don't talk about these things right? Especially in the workplace, there aren't that many people in the workplace that can understand the things that you could be going through or, you know, random comments that are made or, you know, your ability to get promotion yeah. and how perceive you, how that plays into your career development. There's no place to talk about that. Oh my gosh, you are so right. That is so true. And, you know, it just leads to the situation where you're experiencing this in an isolated way. You think you're the only one who's going through this because of the fact that you're typically the only Muslim female, right, in that space. Yes. So you're having all these feelings in an isolated way, but it turns out that we're all kind of experiencing something similar. Right. And that's one of the things that we also want to highlight on this podcast is although we're both physicians, we want this podcast to be for. Muslim professionals in all fields. We can all learn from each other. You know, we'll have young women who are aspiring to not only be, you know, physicians, but, you know, who want to be lawyers and who want to be teachers and whatnot. We're going to 
try and get the perspective of all these professional women in all these diverse fields to give you know their opinions of their experiences and things that they've overcome, the obstacles that they've overcome and how they've overcome them to get to where they are today. There are a lot of accomplished Muslim women out there. They really are out there. <laughs> right. And, you know, we never hear their stories. We don't hear our stories. Like you said in the beginning of the podcast, there's narratives about Muslim women in general are, they skew negative and they tend to mm -hmm. be told from the perspective of an outsider. By discussing, highlighting, bringing to attention accomplished Muslim women, mashallah, who've, you know, done great things, I think this can be inspirational for the young women in our community who want to hear those stories, who would benefit from hearing those stories and feel inspired, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's one of the things that we absolutely lack. I remember looking in the process of doing the research for this podcast to see, you know, if there's something like that out there. I basically came across the same issues that I had when I was pursuing my career to become a surgeon, Yeah. right? I looked for someone that looks like me. You know, you can't be what you can't see. And I tried to look for someone that looked like me. And I couldn't find someone that looked like me that did exactly what I wanted to do. And in looking for this podcast, when I searched, you know, I Googled, I went to YouTube, I went to where all the podcasts are stored. Yeah. And there isn't a podcast for Muslim women that talks about professional advancement. Right. The few things that I found were talking about Muslim women being oppressed. Yeah. Right. Sadly, that is a part of the story that right. we have Muslim women, you know, all over the world that live under suppressive regimes. Yeah. But, you know, there are billions of Muslims in the world, right? Yeah, absolutely. There isn't just one story. There definitely there isn't. is not. <laughs> we're not a monolith of writing. Exactly. So I think those are the stories that we need to tell. And those are the stories that we need to show to our young women to say, you are more than what people's perceptions are. Right. Because the perception is what creates all these stereotypes. Absolutely. And you know, when you are in a position where you are a minority, and you know, especially one that is visually, obviously a minority, and just by living, by wearing a hijab, for instance, or, you know, just by being that one woman in the room, people have prejudices, and you are dealing with this prejudice, whether you know, we like it or not. I think it's good for us to talk about it and to bring it to attention. You know, we deal with and we face prejudice. And these are our experiences. And this is how we overcome it. And this is, you know, what we share. But you know what? We have our own stories to tell. And I think it's so important that we sit down and we talk about how our stories are about so much more than what people's perceptions are and their judgments and their prejudices. And I think that by discussing that and talking about our achievements, about our lives, about how diverse they are and how diverse we are, you know, I think this is going to be a way of many of kind of fighting back against those perceptions and those prejudices. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so now let's do our stories. Okay. Let's introduce uh, ourselves. And I think I made a mistake. I said billions. They're supposed to be like 1.5 billion Muslims. Yeah, I that's believe. That's right. Yeah. It might <laughs> be are... even higher than that now. <laughs> yeah. I think the last figure I read was like 1.65 billion. Okay, 1.65. <laughs> but it's not billions. It's 1, <laughs> 1 billion. <laughs> There's a lot. <laughs> uh, there's a lot. Okay. So now we yeah. can talk about our experiences. So, honey, give us a quick recap of how you came to your career. So a little bit about myself my professional biography. I was lucky in that my parents, the household that I grew up in, my father was pretty liberal. And by liberal, I mean, he was very open and was very encouraging of basically education mm -hmm. for every one of his daughters. My father didn't have any boys. He only had girls. Kind of from an early age, he said, girls, you know, go to school, go to college, go to university, pursue higher education. You know, every step was, okay, think about pursuing the next step. So I naturally kind of gravitated towards the science. I was pretty good at it. Now as an adult, I think being a doctor also had a sort of allure about it, you know, of respect. And, you know, I knew it would make my parents proud. I'm sure that had something to do with my 
judgment call. You know, I was in high school when I was, uh, <laughs> when I said, oh, I'm definitely going to be a doctor. But, you know, the path wasn't easy. I'm sure other Muslim women can relate to this. But one of the things that my parents worried about was student loans, you know, leading to interest payment and kind of getting into that question of the permissibility of that. My father's opinion was that it was kind of a gray zone. And he thought if I could get away from that by paying for my schooling, that that would be beneficial. And in fact, I ended up actually getting my education overseas. I actually trained in medical school in Pakistan. I had my friends there. Yeah, I was there for five years. It follows the British system. So it's like you do your high school, they do their O levels and their A levels, which is their A levels kind of breaks into science and non-science courses. And then you take an entrance exam. I started by doing the entrance exam. Then I went to medical school for five years. And then I ended up, instead of doing my internship, which would be the sixth required year in Pakistan, I ended up actually doing a few externships in the U.S. That kind of got me into the waters in the U.S. So then I ended up training, doing an internal medicine residency in Minnesota. This was after I had, you know, prepared all my DEP exams. So, yeah, I kind of had to do them in a row because I didn't do them in school. (laughs) So it was like, (laughs) wow, (laughs) yeah, it was just kind of one giant block of like studying. It wasn't easy. You know, I remember having to cut my hair super short so I wouldn't feel motivated to go out, you know? I would just, (laughs) my plan was to just stay home, study, Mm -hmm. and just take all of the exams and get all my applications together and go through residency. So alhamdulillah, I got a good position and I really, really enjoyed residency, actually. For me, that was the easy part, maybe because that's the first time as a doctor you have real, true responsibility, you know? (laughs) Yep. (laughs) I really enjoyed that part. I did that for three years, and then I was out in practice for five years. So that's a snippet of my career. I do inpatient medicine mostly. Mm -hmm. So, What was your perception of the difference between training in Pakistan versus doing your residency here? Yeah, you know, there was huge differences, obviously. (laughs) But I think pros and cons. With my training, there was a lot more didactic type learning as opposed to, you know, direct hands-on. So I felt like My basics in science were really strong, but the health systems of the two are so different. That was where I was having challenges. Like I came and all the drug names, the brand names are different. The way healthcare is administered, insurance companies, all of that was like new. So it's almost like the system of it was the most difficult thing to get used to. But I mean, in terms of like doing a physical exam and relying on my physical exam, that's probably the second difference is in developing countries, you rely less on technology and more on your hands. In the US, we talk about a differential diagnosis, which is basically what is the number of diagnoses that could, you know, explain this finding. But in Pakistan, you had to come up with the diagnosis. You had to say, this is my leading diagnosis just based on your, you know, (laughs) right. Just based on your, so I felt like I was stronger than my peers in residency in terms of like doing the exam and doing the hands-on part. I thought that they were much more reliant on technology. So pros and cons overall, I thought it was a good experience going over there. Of course, it's a lot harder now. I think it's much more competitive now. In this environment, I probably wouldn't recommend people to go through that path that I went through because I think it's a tougher path than just you know, going to school here. But at that time, it was a little bit more even, I think. You could train somewhere else and do your residency Mm -hmm. in a different country. But that's, in a shell. I've had my family since then, alhamdulillah, my two kids. And right now I'm practicing part-time. I was full-time up until about a year ago. Just enjoying life, alhamdulillah. So that's my story. (laughs) Let's segue to yours. Tell me about your journey and how you went through your training. I guess the recap version of how you went through your training. (laughs) The recap version. My story is a little similar, except I trained in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So I was in Texas. That's where my family is at. And that's where I did high school, college, medical school, and residency and fellowship. I've always been interested in medicine. And we have a very matriarchal family. Mm -hmm. And the matriarch in our family was my grandmother, Ali Rahma. She had 10 kids Mm -hmm. and like four boys and six girls. Mm -hmm. And she treated them all the same. She said, all of you guys go to school. When they got opportunities to go abroad to school, this was back in the 1970s, 80s. 
she sent them girls by themselves. Oh, you know, that's amazing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It was absolutely amazing. I mean, this is a time when, you know, the girls went to school to find a husband yeah. and, you know, got married off. But she was like, respect yeah. society and people would come and ask oh. for her daughter's hands in marriage. And mm-hmm. she would say, oh, yes, that's wonderful. Let me go ask them. And in private, she would tell them, you're going to school. <laughs> <laughs> That was not typical back then. Yeah, that's it wasn't. It wasn't. Mm-hmm. I think that's one of the things that shaped most of the women in my family is how strong she was. And she was very forward thinking, way ahead of her time. And so naturally in our family, education was important. Yeah. Right. If you weren't going to school, you better have, you know, a darn good reason for not yeah. going to school. Right. It was like school, school, school. That was it. And one of my aunts was actually a doctor in Somalia. Mm-hmm. She was a family practitioner and trained in Thailand. So she came back home and had a clinic in her home and, you know, took care of patients. That was my first exposure to medicine. And then when we were leaving Somalia, my grandmother was shot during the war. So that was my first experience of trauma, you know, someone injured, bleeding. And so when we came here, Alhamdulillah, she did fine and, you know, got better in Somalia. We went to Kenya and then we finally came here. That was 92. She was one of the biggest supporters when I first voiced the fact that I wanted to be a surgeon because mm-hmm. everybody else was like, well, okay, we're in America, alhamdulillah, yeah. lacking. <laughs> but in reality, <laughs> you know, look around, you know, who are the people that are surgeons? Like when we go to the doctor, who do you right. see? And it was, you know, basically, and I started wearing the hijab around, around high school time mm-hmm. and I was adamant about it. And they would ask me, and they said, if they ask you to, you know, take off your hijab, will you do it? And I'm like, no, you know, wow, why? really? Okay. Those were the questions that I was asked to say, wow. you know, in order for you to accomplish what you want, you're going to have to compromise something about you. Wow. Yeah. And the fact that I felt strongly about the hijab, it was made clear. And I remember meeting a Muslim woman at a scholarship dinner when I was a senior in high school and I was graduating. And I asked her, she was a physician. And I said, Oh, you know, very nice to meet you. I'm really interested in doing this in doing surgery. And she's like, well, OB or family medicine, I can see, but surgeon, she's like, my biggest advice to you is don't even think about it. Very blunt. <laughs> I mean, blunt. I, it's a super male dominated field. You know, even now, right now, I don't know what the statistics are, but you it's hardly still very see, male dominated. yeah, you hardly see women. Yes, 19%, ni- 19% of US surgeons are women. Okay. Right. So it's still a small subset. And of that small subset, it's very, very small that are Muslim women and very smaller percentage that are hijab wearing Muslim women, right? Oh my gosh, yeah. I mean, there are some. I went to the American College of Surgeons meeting not too long ago, I think last month, and I saw women that were wearing hijab. That's what I was going to ask. Is there more than you? (laughs) Is there someone else out there? (laughs) Yes, yes, they are. And I was so happy. I saw a couple and I was like, hey, and they're looking at me like, who's that crazy person? Right, right. (laughs) But yes, it's a handful. It's like four or five people. Going into this field for me was very disheartening. And the thing that kept pushing me forward was academically, I would perform well. But then from an academic point, I would be moved up to say like I was finishing college and I received invitation for interviews to medical school. I'm like, you know what? That means I passed, you know, all the requirements. Now they just want to know I'm not a crazy person to be yeah. accepted to medical school. What they talked about was my hijab more than anything else. Really? Wow. In a medical school interview. Yeah, it's right. amazing. You know, it's kind of skating a little bit on legal territory. Yeah, right? Because <laughs> there were multiple things that were illegal that at the time, you're a student looking to get accepted, right. looking to, you know, at whatever cost, you'll yeah, do what, whatever absolutely. you need to do. This is your dream. That, yeah, exactly. So there are a lot of things that when I look back in hindsight, it's like that wasn't supposed to happen. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that wasn't supposed to have been said. In hindsight, I can say that. But at the time, taking any action, that's the other thing is when you take an action like that, it's usually you're taking an action against a big corporation, right? Right. right. Someone actually described this to me because I had brought it up to someone and they said, look at it this way. It's like a tiny little goldfish versus a shark. So you're going to get eaten alive. Your career is going to get ruined and that's going to be the end of it. And so when I thought about it, I said, you know what? 
the impact that I can have is not through me trying to battle one or two things. The impact that I can have is finish this, go through it, do whatever I have to do, whether it's my hijab. Nobody's going to come and tell me to take it off, even though some have tried. Nobody would dare come and cross that line. Mm -hmm. When I was having kids, you know, throughout residency, all these illegal things were being said the harassment, you know, pregnancy discrimination, all these things were happening. But instead of ruining my career in the middle by picking these small fights, the long-term goal that I had was, alhamdulillah, this, yeah. right? Something like this to say, you know what? Yes, it's doable. You can go through it all. You can have the kids that you want to have. You can maintain your authenticity, your identity. You don't have to disavow whatever it is that makes you you. But we have to speak up. Yes. We have to voice the fact that these things are happening. They are not acceptable. Absolutely. And that, you know, we will no longer stand for it. And the way I see things changing is you kind of have to force change. These things don't happen on their own. Yeah, that's amazing. That would break people down to face that and to be judged so strongly and to be told you're not going to make it. Yeah, I mean, it came to a point where it was almost on a daily basis. I think for for me, I was kind of getting under people's skin because I kept having kids. It was like my intern year, my second year. You had all six of your children during training, right? (laughs) Residency. (laughs) All my kids have a residency year. I have my intern baby, my second year baby, my fourth year baby. (laughs) I have my chief year twins and I have my fellowship baby. Mashallah. I feel like (laughs) how you juggled that, you did that, and how you were able to actually finish your residency. That will have to be the subject of its own podcast. I feel like, don't you think so? (laughs) I think that's going to be like something we need to dive into in deep details. (laughs) Yeah, I think we can call that what not to do. (laughs) (laughs) One kid per year. (laughs) One kid per year. What not to do during residency. Right. (laughs) But one of the things that taught me, you know, I've learned multiple, multiple lessons and it has definitely made me grow as a person. It has made me become a better physician. It made me, you know, manage my time better. It has taught me so many things, which is one of the reasons why I think pregnancy should be encouraged in residencies, especially surgery residency. But one of the biggest lessons it has taught me is the fact that it's not the end of the world. When I came into my program, the first intern to be pregnant, Mm -hmm. and they were like, it's never been done. The last person who tried to do this we're still waiting for her to come back from residency. It's never going to be done. Honestly, but, Kali, at this point, you're like minority times five, right? Because just pregnancy has its own, right? Exactly. Uh, its own, you know, discrimination. And just being a pregnant woman in its, of itself is so difficult. So it's like another thing on your, you know, <laughs> that yeah, makes you stick out. <laughs> exactly. So it's like I was a big, you know, sore thumb of the department. Oh, yeah. <laughs> But I guess dealing with all the other discrimination kind of prepared me for this and Mm. prepared me to better handle this. So the lesson that I learned was that by the time I finished Mm -hmm. and I had left the program, almost every single fourth or fifth year resident woman was pregnant. And the program didn't shut down. They didn't have a hard time taking care of the patients. The program adapted and accommodated these pregnant women and everything was fine. They all finished their training. Patients were taken care of. Yeah. So, you know, systems can change. Yeah. People can change. People who were telling me initially, oh, we're going to have to look for another resident to fill this position. By the end, we're saying, oh, we're a family friendly program. What a right? switch. <laughs> a hard fought right. switch, it sounds like. Exactly. Yeah. So that's why I think at the end, when I was finishing, and Alhamdulillah, I was passing my boards and seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Like that's when it clicked me to say, you know what, the low hanging fruit is to be not necessarily the low hanging fruit, but you know what people run towards is, you know, being litigious and saying, oh, I was treated poorly in this place and, you know, I'm going to sue them. Um, And I think that's small thinking to say, okay, they did me wrong. It's this one institution or this one person doing something to me personally. And it's looking Mm -hmm. at individuals. Mm -hmm. But what I see is it's a systematic issue. Yeah. It's a systems wide issue. Like not only did I face this in, you know, residency, but parts of medical school, parts of college, mm-hmm. parts of high school. It's a social thing. It's a societal thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Where it's me being a visual representation of what a Muslim is and what a Muslim woman is. 
That's the reason I was treated that way. When I chose motherhood, even mm -hmm. though I was still pursuing my surgical career, when mm -hmm. I chose motherhood, you know, I was a representation of women who are career oriented, but when it comes to family, they're not going to be able to finish it. I was given as an example, you know, the last woman who mm -hmm. tried to have a kid, but it made her own decision to say, you know what? I choose my family instead of going back to a residency. That's a personal choice. Yeah. But that woman's personal choice, you know, instead of saying that that was her choice, it's a woman's change of It was of used mind. against you. It was, it was used yeah. against all women, right? Yeah, so absolutely. one woman makes a decision that's not in line with what everybody wants. That is used as, you know, a bar for all women to say, oh, the last woman who tried this, you know, it, so yeah. all women are measured by that same bar. Right. Right. So to me, that was another thing that kind of drove me and gave me a little bit more of a push to say, if I fail, then it's, oh, the last Muslim woman who tried to do this. Yeah, you that know, is really remarkable. Yeah. You know, we're used against each other to set examples. So that's why I think looking at the big picture to say, OK, you know what? Don't fight the small battles. Look at this big picture. And if we can get to young, aspiring women to say, you're going to have unsolicited advice coming to you from everywhere, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? I have young women who are, you know, in medical school coming to me and telling me, you know, so-and-so told me that as a woman, I wouldn't be able to do this. I'm like, and who's so-and-so? Oh, it's a male. Oh, and he doesn't have any kids. But he told me his friend who was a woman in medicine oh, couldn't boy. do it. You know? <laughs> it happens all the time, all the time. All the time, mm -hmm. all the time. And the reason I wanted for us to approach this as a professional, you know, Muslim woman, not just this is what we see in medicine. What else is going on out there in all the other fields? Oh, yeah. Your story is remarkable. But, you know, that level of adversity is definitely that challenge, that being stereotyped into a box. And people giving you advice based on those stereotypes, which only serve to pull you down or push right. you down, having to constantly prove yourself. It definitely is pervasive. And I think every woman who's Muslim, who is in the process of professional development, you know, and in the right. process of choosing a career and a family is yep. dealing with, we're all yep. dealing with this to some extent. I think you know, what you faced in this extremely exclusive male dominated world that is surgery, I think is extreme. I really do. And I commend you, Khali, for not only survived that process, but thrived. And then you're coming out the other side happy as ever. You're such a happy person. <laughs> you are, mashallah. To some degree, this is definitely something that all Muslim women around the world are facing. And I think if we can get to that is the exact opposite of what society teaches us, what the yeah. message tells us is right. our position. I think that's where we can have the most impact. I agree. Absolutely. Right. I agree with that sentiment. I think there does need to be another voice. There needs to be a voice that is, you know, giving that the opposite of that message. And that voice should come from us, should come from other women, women who are Muslim from a diverse yeah. background. Yeah. That's why I ask people when they say, oh, so-and-so is telling me this. And I'm like, look at the source. Yeah. You should take that kind of advice with a grain of salt, unless that person has been through it. Like, I can't give advice to someone regarding something that is completely outside of the scope of my field of practice. If they want to know, you know, how to get into law school, I'm like, you know what? You know somebody else who could tell you about yeah. that. I'm not going to delve into an area that is outside of my expertise. But we have people who have no idea what it feels, you know, what it's like to get into medicine, what it's like to handle medicine and family, what it's like to pursue a certain specific field within medicine. Yeah. But they're out there giving all sorts of advice. Absolutely. And you know what? This platform can also then serve, right, as a network because we really want to go out and find other Muslim women, talk to them about their experiences and their challenges and talk to them about their careers, you know, and they can then, you know, kind of be that source for young women who are aspiring into those careers. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Those are some ideas that we have, isn't it, for I'm, this podcast? I'm very excited for this podcast. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope that our listeners are just as excited. We plan on talking a lot of things, inshallah, that's relevant to us as Muslim women. Just kind of any topic, family, career, you know, you talked about the hijab and what that means in life. We talked a little bit about work-life balance. 
self-care, kids, anything that really matters to us. And of course, women. We're going to talk to women and talk about women who are inspirational, who lift us up, who have a good story, and whose story can be meaningful to a young Muslim woman out there, a young Muslim girl, inshallah. Inshallah. All right. That wraps up our podcast pilot introduction to our podcast of professional Muslim women. And with that, we will see you guys in the next podcast. Thank you for listening. Thanks for listening. Thank you for tuning into the Professional Muslim Women Podcast, the place for Muslim women to inspire and be inspired. Please join us on our Facebook group, Professional Muslim Women, to continue the conversation and connect with Muslim women like you. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and drop us a like or a review. We look forward to hearing from you soon.